I wanted to start off by talking a little bit about some characteristics of champions and what makes them so special and what makes them so inspiring. Um, champions have physical attributes at the top level of sports, okay? But let me promise you that the wingspan or the big hands and feet or the vertical jump are not what makes champions great because everyone at the top level has physical skill and attributes. What makes champions great is what's up here and what's in here. And those are the things I'd like to talk about today. Champions have a clear plan for success and for achieving their goals. It's not just a random occurrence where they show up at a game or a swim meet or some other event and just get in there and the talent takes over. They have a plan. Champions welcome challenges as a means to learn and grow. They welcome challenges because a lot of becoming a champion is about failure. You know, what we get to see or on TV is the end product of a very long process of ups and downs. And sometimes we get to see the downs on TV. But usually if the process is sound, you get to see the end result of success. But that process is a very long and difficult one for anyone. Champions produce normal and predictable performances in very abnormal and unpredictable environments talk about that a little bit later, particularly in terms of the Olympics, which I always tell my kids uh, the Olympics are a series of sporting, of sporting events arranged around a big media event, which is about what it is these days. Champions rehearse success on a daily basis, mentally, physically, and emotionally. They value the process of success more than any particular outcome. I think if I had to say my coaching philosophy, that's it. The process is more important than the outcome. Because that's what is controllable, and that's what's within our ability to deal with. The outcomes are largely dependent on what other people do. I think Nick Saban, coach at Alabama, he has a really good saying. He says, don't look at the scoreboard, play the next play. And that's what we try to do when we're swimming. We don't worry about what's going to happen at the end or what place we're going to get. We worry about how we're going to do the first turn. Most importantly, champions have a dream because that's how this whole thing starts. And they have a passion for pursuing that vision of success that they have that will overcome obstacles, get them through the tough times, and carry them to some spectacular performances throughout their career. The dream is critical because that's where it starts. And the dream is not something incredibly specific. It's something emotional, something that gets you here. You know, nobody's going to get out of bed in the morning to finish their 200 freestyle in 52.5. <laughs> it's just not exciting. But somebody might get out of bed in the morning to be the most decorated Olympian of all time. Sometimes he got out of bed for that. <laughs> the dream ignites the creative process. As soon as it's in place, it's almost like a bomb goes off, and all of these things are working towards it, if you have the correct mental picture. The dream establishes the forest, you know, and then we start looking for the trees. It lets you know where we're going, what direction are we headed. You know, that's what the dream gives you. And it does get you out of bed on those cold mornings because nobody can be the best ever if they don't make the decisions the right way on a daily basis. That dream can change a little bit. Michael Phelps at 12 years old came into practice one day and we were talking about something, I don't know, it came up and some of the kids were talking about swimming the Olympics. Michael said, I want to swim in the Olympics. I said, really? He's like, yeah. I was like, well, that's a good goal, but you better do a lot of butterfly if you're going to do that, so let's hop in and get going, right? <laughs> it's pretty far off today. Here's what we're doing. A little bit later, at 15, 
His goal was to change the sport of swimming. He had already been in the Olympics. And he said, I want to see swimming on ESPN. And until him, it never was, but now it is. He's on Sports Center. Other swimmers are on Sports Center. The nation has really started to care more about our sport, largely because this kid, who was 12, had a dream. And finally, it changed one more time when he was 21 years old. Uh, we were sitting in my office at the University of Michigan with his mother and his agent and myself. And we were having a meeting two years before the Beijing Olympics. And what we were talking about was expectations and how he wanted to pursue the Olympics in terms of expectations. Because you saw in 2004 in Athens, he showed the world that he could swim a big program. And he might be able to do something that no one had done before. But also, we knew what came with that would be a lot of expectations, a lot of pressure, a lot of responsibility on his part to live up to those expectations. So we were sitting in this meeting, and we talked about, well, what do you really want to do? Because we can really lay it out there if you want. If you really want to go for something no one's done before, you'll get the media deals, the sponsors, you'll have the media, you'll be out there. We can put you out there. But if we put you out there and you don't come through, it's not that much fun. Or we could walk it back and say, Michael's just happy to go to Beijing and hopes he wins some medals and won't have as many deals, he won't have the pressure either. And he looked up and looked me in the eye, and I've never believed anything more in my whole life than when he said, I want to be the best ever. I can feel it right now. And when he said those words, it was like a bomb went off in my head about what I needed to do. Because as soon as he said that, and he said, are you in? I said, I'm already there. I knew exactly where we were headed. I knew what we were going to do. And I knew what kind of big mountain we were going to climb. And I was going to do everything in my power to have him prepared to do something that no one else had ever done. Well, the dream is all well and good, but you've got to have a plan. And that's where I come in. We teach our swimmers that the way to get anywhere is through goals, goal setting. Pretty basic. I'm sure you do that in your lives. But we take it to a very, uh, I would say, intense level because I make the swimmers really go through a process of evaluating what is your dream goal. We know that when we start. And then we start working backwards to where we are. And once we have those goals in place, we have a plan that takes us down the road. There are a lot of different kinds of goals. There are, you know, fairly long-term goals, which for us were about eight to ten years with Michael. He was that young, I could say, this kid's going to be really good. I want to see if I can look at the end of his career and get him started the right way. There were more immediate goals. Every four years, the Olympics provides nice little benchmarks for us. Our whole, you know, world operates on a four-year calendar. And that's still fairly vague, but you can identify some themes that we're going to work on and things that we'd like you to do. And then finally, you get down to about one year, and we can do that really specifically. I can plan what I want an athlete to do every day for a whole year with some real reliability, unless they screw it up, of course. And then we change. <laughs> but the most important goal that they have is short-term goal, and it's not even short. It's what I call the immediate goal, and it's where the rubber meets the road. And that is, what are you going to do right now? I'll give you an example. Any of us here could uh, list all the benefits of eating better, right? Eating healthy. Going to live longer, going to live better, going to feel better, might look better. Everybody would agree with that. Everybody could find a resource that would help them come up with a plan to do that. And even a time frame. By six months, I would like to achieve this. But the key decision in all of this process is going to be, what do you do when the cookie's in your hand? You're going to put it in your mouth. You're going to put it on the table. That's where progress is made. I'm about 50-50 on that one. But um, sometimes I make it, sometimes I don't. But that's what we do in the goal-setting process. And Michael's very good at goal-setting. 
Um, when Michael was 13, I sat down and took him through a goal-setting process where he listed three events. He listed his times to the hundredth of a second that he'd like to swim, three things that he would have to do to achieve each goal, and uh, kept that paper on his refrigerator, so he looked at it every day. <laughs> he ate a lot, so he saw it a lot, right? He was 13. <laughs> I think that next year he gained almost 60 pounds. It's hard to believe, but he grew about a lot. Okay. So he's got these goals, and at the end of the, that year, he swam the meet where the goals were supposed to be done. He started swimming these times, and I started thinking, you know, I don't have that sheet in front of me, but these are pretty close. Well, in three events, they were this close. His 200 fly was 204.68. He went 204.68. That's hard to do, right? In the 1,500 meters, which lasts longer, uh, the goal was 16 minutes .00. He went 16 minutes .8, so he was 8 tenths of a second over 16 minutes. And in the 400 IM, he wanted to go 431.86. He went 431.81. He does that all the time. And to me, that means if you have a very good eye for goal setting and you know how to specifically turn that into your training on a daily basis, you can predict what your performance is going to be. The goal setting process also lets you choose the menu of things that you're going to work on on a daily basis. Champions need things to work on. They all have things. Uh, a good example for this past meet was a young lady that swam with us, Allison Schmidt, who ended up uh, actually winning five medals, three gold medals, after winning one bronze medal the last time in Beijing. And I felt like for her, her big challenge was strength. She wasn't physically very strong, and that's really important in terms of swimming. So we started working on some simple goals, and I think one of the reasons people say, how did Allison improve so much? I say it's very simple. She went from being able to do zero pull-ups, okay, to being able to do three sets of eight or nine. That's a significant change. But when we have a plan where we're looking for what are the strength gains we need? What are the gains we need in the water? What are the technical improvements we're going to make? All of these things kind of come together, and you can work on it in a comprehensive unit. And that's how performances are made. Being the planner, and you got to think of me as like a GPS, right? Like, swimmers drive in this car. I'm that annoying thing on the dashboard, okay? I'm saying turn right, and sometimes they turn right, and it, things are good. But sometimes I'm saying turn right, turn right, and they keep going off to the left, you know, and then all of a sudden I'm like recalibrating, recalibrate. You know how that does? Get you back to your goal? Well, that's how these plans are. And I'll tell you how one time our plan came off the tracks. Um, in early, actually late 2007, Michael had had the best swim meet a swimmer had ever had in the Melbourne World Championships. He won seven gold medals, broken, I think, six world records, and we were looking pretty good for Beijing. Because my goal for 2007 was to have him so good at that world championships that he could be 20 or 30 percent less and still win every event in Beijing. And I thought we were there. He had a big mental edge over the competition, and he had a physical edge. And he came back, and he was training brilliantly. Every day I would give him something, he would do it, he would get better. Every day he was getting better. We got to the end of the year, and uh, we had completed a training week, and I had gone home, and it was, uh, I'll never forget, I had uh, gotten up and done a run, I'd gone to Whole Foods, I'd come home, and I'd chopped up all these vegetables, and I made vegetable soup. It was on the stove. And I get a call from the emergency room, and they said, uh, Michael's broken his hand. We had a bunch of ice in Ann Arbor, did one of these. All of a sudden, our plan changed. And let me tell you, to this day, I still can't eat vegetable soup. I'm not kidding. That's how much it affected me. I was like, oh, what am I going to do? So I got there, and he was, I I'm, wouldn't be exaggerating if I said he was in a panic. He was very upset and emotional, and he said, you know, I've just given away three gold medals. I don't know which one they were. I guess the three he thought were hardest to win. He wasn't going to do it now because he's going to have to deal with this. And this was about nine months before our trials, eight months. And I have to be honest, I felt the same way. 
I'm like, what are we going to do? And then I just started doing the only thing I could. Let's look at the facts. Let's find out what we can do. I went to the doctor and I said, tell me what we can do for this. And there was a uh, first option. Okay, we're going to put him in a cast for six weeks. I was like, okay, what's plan B? That doesn't work for me. <laughs> the University of Michigan doctors didn't really like that. I said, well, we could do surgery. And if we put a pin in it, the only thing you have to wait is for 10 days for the stitches to heal. And then he can get back to normal training. I said, we're done. Next morning, he was in surgery, right? So then he came back, and for 10 days, uh, he grew to love, I actually grew to hate, a stationary bike. I grew to love it. But uh, he probably will never ride another bike again, because I had him on that for, thing for three hours a day, right, every day for those 10 days. Uh, I will have to say I cheated a little bit. We put a plastic bag on it, put him in the water about seven days, but don't tell the doc. It seemed to turn out okay, uh, so he could kick. But that's an example of this perfect plan that's rolling right along to where we want to go, and it just comes off the tracks. And basically, we had to say, look, how are we going to deal with this problem, and what are we going to do, and how quickly can we do it? And once everybody got on board, it really wasn't that bad. Two weeks later, he was back training. It wasn't perfect, but he got into it pretty well and went on to do some pretty good things after. We want to teach swimmers to get the best possible performance in the worst possible conditions. Because that's what these Olympics are like. You go to the Olympics and you stay in the worst room that you've been in. You don't have a nice hotel room. You have a suite with about eight people. You have to do a lot of different things. So I do a lot of techniques like stepping on goggles and the like to, uh, you know, I stepped on his goggles so he practiced swimming with his goggles filled up with water when he was little. One time, came back in Beijing, his goggles filled up with water in the 200 fly. We were glad we did that because he just counted his strokes. I try to give them opportunities every day to build confidence and to see themselves as the person they want to be because visualizing success for a champion is the key thing in their repertoire. I think that as we go through, and I've done this more and more times, I can't really know of anything more valuable than them being able to see the clear picture of where they want to go, set up the plan for how they want to get there, and then on a daily basis come in and rehearse that success. Because that, to me, is what makes a champion. I really appreciate you sharing some time with me, and I look forward to hearing the other speakers. Thank you.